The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Yes, indeed, sports fans, dreams do come true. If you've dreamed over the years that Dan Snyder would be gone, that dream has come true. If you're an Orioles fan and you dreamed over the years that the Angelos family would be gone, it appears that dream is also going to come true. Wow. What a couple of years it's been for this area, huh? Yeah. All right. And the sale of the Orioles might impact what happens with the sale of the Nationals if, in fact, that ever happens. Looks like they've been in the market now for a couple of years. And they're still owned by the Lerner family. But uh, this agreement that is being reported with David Rubenstein paying $1.7 billion to buy the team could mean that the Masson deal goes away. And once the Masson deal goes away, that would seem to clear things up for a possible sale of the Nationals and possibly to Ted Leonsis, though I would think he'd have to partner with somebody else. He certainly couldn't partner with David Rubenstein, who will be owning the team up the road. But, uh, yeah, things are changing and changing quickly. And uh, you might look at what happened yesterday with the commanders and go, huh, huh, well, new ownership and still some stumbles. Yeah, there, there's that. And uh, who knows, you know, whose fault it is or, or if there's any fault at all. But Ben Johnson's not coming here as the head coach. And uh, we'll take a deeper dive into that coming up and uh, a lot of talk about uh, what's happening with the Orioles and um, and what this is going to mean. Cal Ripken is reportedly involved in the ownership group, which makes all the sense in the world. I don't know if he'd have a role in maybe procuring, procuring players or, uh, you know, they've got a guy, Mike Elias, who's done a hell of a job so far. I would think he'd be something like team president. I think that would be uh, that would be a good role for him. And I think his – his baseball knowledge is superb, and I think he would do a wonderful job, and it would be a real feel-good to see uh, Cal associated with the Orioles again. So we'll get to that. Uh, Tom Brady had some comments about his future. Looks like he is going into the booth. Looks like he's shoving Greg Olson aside, said, move over, son. The goat's stepping in, and he's going to work with Kevin Burkhart next year. He talked about it yesterday on the Pat McAfee show. We'll play some of those comments. And uh, and also, we uh, continue to cull through these terrific interviews that were done by Joe Buck some years ago. And uh, today we got the Shannon Sharp conversation uh, in which he talks about uh, how he grew up his amazing upbringing to become a Hall of Fame tight end, uh, mostly for the Denver Broncos, but he also won a Super Bowl with the Baltimore Ravens. So we'll dive into that. But we should have been listening the other day when Adam Schefter said this to Pat McAfee. People have said here that they think Ben Johnson is going to Washington and Dan Quinn is going to Seattle. Yes. And I will bet you, I will bet you that at a minimum, one of those is not right. Hmm. At a minimum. Okay. Maybe maybe Whoa. both. Well, so far, uh, one of them's not right because uh, Ben Johnson is staying in Detroit. And as far as Dan Quinn goes, uh, he may not wind up in Seattle. He may wind up here because he was in for an interview yesterday. Somebody spotted him at Reagan Airport and they asked him, you know, how it went. He said the interview went well, but the the photo that I saw of him standing in the security line, he didn't look thrilled. So <laughs> I don't know how well it went. And uh, I also heard a reporter yesterday on another station uh, with the Tacoma News, I believe it is, a newspaper uh, just outside of Seattle. And he says he doesn't think that Quinn is coming to the Seahawks. So Schefter's right. Maybe both on that. Um, Quinn could come here. That could still work out. And Ben McDonald, not Ben McDonald. I knew I was going to do that. Ben McDonald, great pitcher for the Orioles. This is Mike McDonald, who has uh, been their defensive coordinator, and he's now a hot candidate. And uh, look, you know, the, the Kansas City game wasn't the defense's fault. They've, they've done a hell of a job this year. Uh, the thing is, you know, the, the the move seems to be to hire an offensive guy, not necessarily a defensive guy. But, you know, it depends on who you get as an offensive coordinator that plays a, a big role in that. Um, but I would say this about about what what's Ben Johnson is is doing here. He, he there there are various reasons being thrown out uh, why he's staying. Uh, he cited that he wants to win a Super Bowl. Well, if you're really competitive, you want to win a Super Bowl as a head coach. And you got an opportunity to build something here where in four or five years, if things go right, 
you might have an opportunity to build a Super Bowl championship team. That might happen. And to be a ride-along in Detroit where most of the credit, if not all the credit, would go to Dan Campbell, is that what you want? I mean, the only time I can remember a Super Bowl champion where the defensive coordinator, or even the offensive coordinator for that matter, got the bulk of the credit was the 85 Bears, the uh, Mike Ditka, Buddy Ryan, Chicago Bears. And the offense was okay. You know, they had Walter Payton, they had Willie Galt. Jim McMahon was a fine quarterback, not a Hall of Fame quarterback, but good. But their defense was all world. It was it was incredible. One of the, I think, if not the greatest defense of all time in the conversation for that. And when it came time to carry the coaches off the field, Ditka got a ride, but so did Buddy Ryan. And I don't think in the history of the Super Bowl there's ever been a defensive coordinator or an offensive coordinator who was carried off the field by his players on their shoulders. Now, we knew that Ryan, that was going to be his last game in Chicago. He was going to Philadelphia to take over as coach of the Eagles. But still, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't buy the idea that, oh, I, I want to win a Super Bowl and I want to complete what I'm doing in Detroit. I don't know if there's going to be a better opportunity for him next year. And – there may not necessarily be opportunities at all. And let me play this from yesterday from Tony and Mike on PTI because it's, it, it gets into what Dan Quinn was talking about um, when he uh, had his postgame news conference on Sunday that, you know, like the old song, we may never walk this way again. And you don't know what's going to happen with injuries. You don't know what's going to happen with your team. Uh, There's going to be changes anyway because the salary cap forces you to do things. Players get a year older. All kinds of things happen that might prevent you from getting back to this step again to the NFC Championship game. And how hot of a candidate is Ben Johnson going to be next year? Uh, This was Tony and Mike last night on PTI on those Dan Campbell comments from Sunday. Campbell said this is a direct quote. I told the guys this may have been our only shot. Do I think that? No. Do I believe that? No. However, I know how hard it is to get here, and it's going to be twice as hard to get back next year, unquote. Wilbon, do you agree with Campbell? Everything he said. That and more stuff, and he went on, and all of it. Every word of it. Yes, we see this. We see teams. Look at the Atlanta Falcons. All right, they got a step further. They got to the Super Bowl, and then they, they went away. I mean, you knew you don't know. You have injuries. You have people performing not to the level that they did. You have people overperforming, outperforming, you know, their sort of career resumes for this particular year, and they fall back into something that's more comfortable and familiar, and that's not good enough. Yeah. Yes. I mean, not everybody is Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady. As a matter of fact, there are few people like that. You go back over years and years and years. And, Tony, I think Campbell understands what this team – how they connect with him. And he knows that that plain talk appeals to their sense of whatever, pride, fair play, professionalism, and good for him for for continuing along that path. Yeah, I agree. I agree with almost everything you have said there. Dan Campbell was talking to his team last night or the other day through the media, just like Doc Rivers did yesterday. This is psychology. This is how it works. He knows what pushes their buttons, and they fall in line, and and they really like him. Look, it's hard. There's 16 teams in a conference, and only one gets to the Super Bowl, right? And he's got to get past San Francisco, which isn't going anywhere, and it's possible Dallas and Philadelphia will be a lot better next year like they were in the middle of this past season. He's got to worry about the Packers, probably has to worry about the Rams. Um, it's, It's a hard thing to do, but he's got a good quarterback, and he's got good running backs, and he's got good wide receivers. The defense has to get a little bit better. Mike, I think what he's saying is rhetoric. I think he's appealing to the pride of his players. He likes them a lot, and they like him a lot. And he yeah. says, do I believe this? No. You know, I, because they, they're not a one-trick pony, Mike. They built something there over three years now. That's a pretty good team. But, Tony, yes. But you don't know what's coming. You don't. You don't. I mean, you, you know, you're, the other team is one draft pick away from some great, great player who can then stifle you, and you've got injuries. In football, you've got some uncontrollable elements that don't even exist to the same degree in basketball, baseball, and the NHL. So, I, yeah, I believe that Detroit has built something that looks like it can be sustained. But you know what else? They had something yes. that looked like it was sustainable when they had Barry Sanders. And they, it's still cracking through that. You know, I, 
I, it was a weak division a year ago, Tony. Do I think it's going to be a weak division with the Bears with these picks and with the players available to them and the Packers already a step, if not two, ahead of the Bears and the Vikings no. not far off the pace? No, they're going to be, and they're going to get a first place Here's what schedule. they got, Mike. They got a, they got a hard road. I understand all that. They just got something today that they needed. They have an offensive what? coordinator coming back, not becoming a head yeah, coach. Ben Johnson, a good thing. they like a lot. Very good thing. Although yep. he should have run the ball more in the second half have. against the 49ers, and they need a kicker so they don't have to go on fourth all the time. Yeah, and as far as Ben Johnson uh, goes staying, yeah, I'm sure that's going to be helpful to the Lions. Uh, why he didn't you know, uh, move on in the process, either with here or, here or Seattle, over a remain a mystery, but uh, Albert Breer reported at SI.com today that uh, he didn't interview particularly well with the commanders in his first go round. Um, so that may have been part of it. He, he maybe didn't think he was going to get the job, and being rejected for a job is, is also something you, you don't want to do. So before they can reject you, you reject them, though he did it in an odd way yesterday with Josh Harris and his group on the plane to go interview him. Uh, they wound up interviewing Aaron Glenn anyway. He was uh, defensive co- is the defensive coordinator of the Lions. I don't know how far he is, is in the process, but all the reports that it was going to be Johnson as the head coach, not going to happen. And who knows if we'll ever find out the true reason why, why he pulled out in the way that he pulled out. I mean, that's kind of a, it's kind of a schmucky move, you know, <laughs> that, that you wait until the, the owner gets on the plane to come see you before you say, nah, forget it. Um, I, I'm not interested anymore. So they'll have a coach, and they'll have a coach by the end of the week. And look, I, I, let me say this about um, hiring assistant coaches. I go back to 1996 when Joe Gibbs made it in the Hall of Fame. And Dan Deardorff was also in that class. And Deardorff had played for the St. Louis Cardinals when Gibbs was an assistant under Don Coriel, the head coach of the team. And before the induction ceremony, I don't know whether they do it the same way now. This is when they would do it Saturday morning on the steps of the, uh, the Hall of Fame. Now it's a big Saturday night hoo-ha affair. But um, in those days, they would have a news conference for each of the inductees before the ceremony. And Gibbs did his, and then Deardorff did his, and Deardorff was asked about Gibbs who he knew, obviously, from his days with St. Louis. And Deardorff, an offensive player, had worked with Gibbs. And he said, you know, of the assistants on that staff, I think that Joe Gibbs would have been pretty far down the line if you asked me who on the staff would become a successful head coach. So you just don't know. Now, you know, Gibbs was coming here off what Coriel did in San Diego. He was the offensive coordinator of of that high-flying offense, which is what he wanted to do here. And it didn't work out. And then in the middle of the stream, five games in, 0 and 5, he changed course, became a running team, and the rest is history. So, you know, we look at these assistants and we say, oh, man, that really sucks that they didn't get him. Well, who knows if he's any good? And who knows if they wind up with Ben McDonald? Not Ben, I did it again. And I, if they hire him, I hope they don't, I hope I don't do this. Mike McDonald, if they wind up with Mike McDonald, then maybe he will be a success, or Dan Quinn in his second go-round. It's not like he was a complete failure in Atlanta. He did get that team to the playoffs and to the Super Bowl. They did blow the 28-3 to lead. Yes, they did, but uh, he's been highly regarded as, an, as a coordinator in stops in Seattle and in Dallas and uh, I think was liked in Atlanta. Uh, it, just, uh, it just fell apart after the Super Bowl appearance. Uh, one other follow-up on, on Dan Campbell. i got to play this because when we talk about goats, the goat of the sports radio rant is Chris Russo. And I've known him since he was in his early 30s. We worked together at WFAN, and uh, when we were both part-timers, I used to drive him home from Queens to the city on my way back to my house in Rockland County, and uh, I've considered him to be a friend for, for a long, long time. He's, he's been very nice to me over the years, and I think he's, he's really a good person. But it's, it's funny to hear him now with these rants because he's ranting as a senior citizen. And he made his name ranting as a 33-year-old, 34-year-old, kind of a young punk, you know, ripping the establishment. So he took off, he took off uh, yesterday or the day before, maybe it was Monday, uh, on, on Dan Campbell and how he handled that second half where he went for it on fourth down and didn't kick field goals. And, and when you hear Russo's references, 
their old guy references. So that's what makes this so great. And he's he's the king of this. He knows how to do this. So this is Chris Russo on his Sirius XM radio show, giving it to Dan Campbell after the Lions' loss in San Francisco. You could have been in a situation where you'd be playing in a Super Bowl. Super Bowl. And those poor fans in Michigan, this ruins their year. I Listen, I shouldn't say that because you'll probably get over it. But you tell me right out. You tell me right now. If you are a Lions fan, you tell me right now for the next month when they get this game played and everything else, the month of February, what are you going to be thinking about? Beating Baker Mayfield or the fact that the Niners did the rights? My God almighty. Pay attention, Campbell. Jesus, I mean, this is, excuse me, this is ridiculous. And I know we like you, Dan. You're a nice guy. You represent the city of Detroit. Blue collar, tough. Oh, we get all the nonsense. But manage the game properly. You have a chair. I understand it's a long field goal, 240 yarders, but your kicker's good. You have a very... You got a chance to go back up by three scores and you go for it on fourth down and then all the dopes on Twitter are backing you up. The the the, the, the data freaks who wouldn't know Lombardi for Paul Brown. Never heard of Otto Graham. Kenny Stabler, Madden. Wouldn't know him if they fell on him. They do football via math. That's not how you do football. Oh, my God, what a loss. <laughs> Wouldn't know Lombardi from Paul Brown or Otto Graham. I mean, Otto Graham, that's really reaching back because I think he concluded his career in the 50s, maybe the early 60s. <laughs> that's even before Russo. So uh, yeah, that's that's a master at work. That's, that's a radio rant as good as it gets. And uh, whether you agree or disagree, you have to admire the talents of one Christopher Russo. All right, uh, coming up, uh, Tom Brady talked yesterday on the Pat McAfee show about his role, and he is full steam ahead into going into the booth next year for Fox. I've had my doubts whether this will happen, and now there's there's a new twist to this with Greg Olson getting – all kinds of compliments like, oh, he's the best analyst in the business right now. And he's being shoved aside for Tom Brady. Uh, what's going to happen to him next? And Brady, in the in, in this conversation, I'm going to play play some of it, but in the conversation, he, he made it pretty clear it's going to be he and Burkhart next year, that, that there's no room for three in the booth. That's not the deal that he cut. He's making $37.5 million a year from Fox for 10 years, and it's going to be – Brady and Burkhart as the number one team next year. Uh, we'll get to that, plus uh, what he says about the uh, new GOAT debate. Is he the GOAT or is it Patrick Mahomes? I think it's kind of ridiculous myself, but Brady gives his take. We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. All right, we got a Tony show coming up on this gray Wednesday. A little bit warmer, though, about 50 degrees, not bad, and... Tomorrow's supposed to be a nice day. Um, Tom Brady making the rounds. Um, not exactly you know, been in hiding for the past year. He's been visible, but he's taken the season off and uh, now is getting ready for his next venture, which I wasn't sure was going to happen. I really had my doubts about this. Uh, you remember that he agreed to that deal with Fox, 10-year deal, $375 million, just, just absolutely mind-blowing, and you had Greg Olson in the booth. Now, it's, it's, it's been a, I, it has to have been an odd year for Olson in that um, he knows he's lame duck, um, and it's like, you know, it's like you're married, and you know that your wife is dating Brad Pitt, <laughs> and, and when push comes to shove, you're going to be shoved out the door no matter how much – in shape you are, you know, how, how good your skin looks, um, you know, how nice you are to her. She, she's dumping you. And, and you've known that for a while. And not only while you're married, that while you're married, she's dating. Uh, while, while the season has been going on and Kevin Burkhardt has been doing games with Greg Olson. And by the way, the two of them getting lots and lots of compliments and they had done the Super Bowl together last year um, that, that this was, you know, ongoing like behind this not even really behind the scenes because Burkhardt had to be open about it there wasn't a secret that that Brady was doing practice games with him 
during the week, uh, flying out to Los Angeles where Burkhart lives and uh, going into the Fox studios and, and working together and preparing and, and all the things that go into it. And, uh, and here we are at the end of the 2023 season, heading into 2024, and it looks like it's full steam ahead for Tom Brady. I thought, you know, he'd have second thoughts. I also thought that he might talk to the Mannings, and he might talk to Peyton Manning and say, dude, what are you doing? Eli and I, we, we do Monday night football from our couches at home. We don't have to schlep all over the country. We don't have to sit in these stupid meetings. We don't have to watch practices. We just watch the game and have some guests on, and we're, we're having a good time. You really want to get into this grind week after week? Tra- I know it's a private plane and, and, and all the trappings that go with your wealth. I understand all that. But do you really want to do that, and you want to be standing in the hot dog line at halftime with sports writers you know, waiting to get something to eat? Is, is that really what you want? Well, he's saying he wants it. This, this was Brady yesterday on the Pat McAfee show on what his plans are moving ahead and how he's preparing to do so. I've been out to Fox Studios a few times and done some, some really dry runs with Kevin, who is tremendous at what he does. I'm super excited to join an amazing team, um, Rich, Russo, Rich Russo and Richie Zions. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about football. We've talked a lot about how I see the game. And I think Greg's done an incredible job. I have so much respect for him, how he approaches his job. He's super prepared in what he does. Um, I think he does an incredible job every time he's on. I love listening to him. Um, and, and I'm just going to go in there and do the best I can do with my own perspective. And I certainly have had a unique vision and perspective of the game of 23 years. And hopefully I just can provide some insight to all the viewers yeah. and all the fans who yeah. love the I'd game, say it's love unique. the sport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unique. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'd say, yeah. It's unique. You know, I've been a part of a lot of, you know, I've been a part of a lot of Super Bowls, championship games. I've had some, you know, seasons that didn't go the way we wanted. I have some injuries. I was undrafted rookie. I've seen guys come in with great expectations and not meet it. I've seen underdogs like Julian Edelman come along and make it. So, again, I think I've had 23 years of just observing. And I, I get to go on now and speak to a wider audience. And I used to probably use my body and my brain out there and people would see me kind of, lead the team down the field, and now I get to do that in a different way using my voice. Tommy, Bubba, you got the job. You, you, you don't have to lay out your credentials there, that you've seen the game from a unique perspective, and you've done it for 23 years, and you've seen the guys who've come up and, and how they've handled it. I, I get it. We get it. You, you got the job. I just I, I just didn't really think he was going to do the job, but he's going ahead, and later in the conversation, they got into more specifics, and he is going to be in the booth with Burkhart. That's going to be it. Uh, there, I saw some speculation uh, that maybe they'd have a three-man booth. Nope, that's not going to happen. Now, what happens to, to Greg Olson is, is going to be interesting. I've, I've even read some speculation. I don't think it's going to happen because they're not going to pay off Romo. But they may boot Romo to put Olson in because he's become that good. Um, maybe NBC makes a move. You know, Maybe they say to Chris Collinsworth, hey, you know, it's time for – for young blood in here and, and we're moving you out, you know, I don't know. I mean, the Collinsworth family now is, he's got his kid doing Notre Dame games. I think, I think that the whole Collinsworth clan is, is involved in that. So, uh, you know, whatever's going to happen with Greg Olson, it's not going to be tied to Tom Brady because Tom Brady has already made his decision known that he's moving into the booth and uh, what happens with Olson. We'll have to see, you know, uh, remember when Jason Witten, left the Cowboys and went right into the Monday night booth and was terrible, absolutely terrible, and went back to playing a year later, played another year with the Cowboys and a year with the Raiders, and now is coaching high school football and will probably never see the inside of a broadcast booth again because he was stiff and awful. But they put him right in there because he had played for the Cowboys because he was a name, and reportedly he had it in his contract that it was only going to be a two-man booth. Joe Tessitore and Witten. Remember the remember the Monday night game? Everybody had these three-letter nicknames: Tess and Boog and and Wit. You know the the three the three syllables, <laughs> not the three Stooges, but the three syllables. It was a it was a bad broadcast, and Witten was the worst of it. He was just terrible. Well, they they knew. I guess they knew how stiff he was, and they they knew that he couldn't be the only voice with Joe Tessitore. So that's when they came up with the Booger Mobile. Remember Booger McFarland was uh, on this rolling cart <laughs> that was down on the field. It was just, just ridiculous. And he was given his take from down there. Well, they did that because the contract said that Witten was the only analyst allowed in the booth. 
So that's how they got around it. So, I, you know, uh, I think Brady will be good. I don't think there's any question about that. It's just how much motivation is he going to have. Uh, more from Brady, and this is I, – I can't believe that this is a real serious debate right now because Tom Brady won seven rings, and he won a seventh one in a different place from Bill Belichick to put to rest the Brady or Belichick argument. That That is now a moot point. But – um but anyway, he um, he now is getting things said about him like, oh, yeah, he was great. But Patrick Mahomes right now has supplanted him as the GOAT, as the greatest of all time. He's certainly a better athlete and he does a lot of different things on the field. But I think he needs to start, you know, winning more rings. Not that he hasn't been good at it so far and has made the Super Bowl in four of his six years as a starter and, and could add his third ring this year. But uh, you still, if you get three – Still four behind Brady. You got to get more than twice as many as you have. So this this goat debate, I think, is a little bit foolish. Uh, this is Brady handling it yesterday on the McAfee show, probably about as diplomatically as he can. There's nothing that Patrick can do, in my opinion, that takes away from what I tried to accomplish in my career, and there's nothing that I did can take away from what he's trying to accomplish. I, I feel like I all I tried to be was the best I could be. And I didn't, even though I had sporting idols, like I said, I could never be Steve Young. I could never be Joe Montana. Those are the guys I, I could never be Dan Marino or John Elway. These were my childhood idols. And they had incredible careers. And and they put as much as they could into their career. And I really respect them for that. And, and I just tried to do the same thing. And believe me, if anybody can go out there and win seven Super Bowls, I have so much respect for them. I understand how difficult it is. I will congratulate them, and I'm going to, you know, give whatever it is a big hug. I texted my friend um, who who plays with Pat um, after the game, and I just said, tell him congrats. I mean, just awesome to watch him play, and I love watching him lead his team. And of all the things I love, I love leadership, and I love people that are selfless. I hate selfish teammates. I, help, I, I don't like being around people that are self-serving and always trying to create their own self-serving narrative about who they are. I, I love teams. I love team sports. I love celebrating success with other people and the businesses I'm a part of, whether that's being a part of the Fox broadcast team. I know that I'm just playing one role, whether it's being a part of, of Noble. I know I'm playing one role. I need a lot of other teammates to help me come in and be successful. And I embrace that. I'm, I'm, there's so many things I'm not good at. And there's so many things I don't know. I get to be around people that are the best in the world at what they do, and I get to learn from them. So I see that as just continuing to add to my own learnings and my growth, and I still have hopefully a long life ahead. We'll see how it goes, but um, I've enjoyed it to this point, and, and hopefully there's a great second chapter ahead. Uh, well, uh, the, the chapter, no matter what happens with the broadcasting, it's, it's good. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're Tom Brady. You, 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 got, you got the world at your feet. And uh, whatever you decide to do, successful in business, um, is he going to be successful in broadcasting? Who knows? I mean, it didn't work out for Joe Montana, but they do seem to be different personalities. And uh, I think I think Brady will work at it. Looks like he, he is. He's fully committed to it. So uh, count me wrong on that. Uh, I have not had a time had time to uh, delve into this, but the Washington Post today has a big expose on uh, the concussion settlement that was made with the NFL. This this goes back seven years, so it's it's quite a while ago, 2017. And if you remember, there were ex-players who were suffering from dementia, ALS, all kinds of issues related to head trauma. And they sued the NFL, and the NFL settled with them, and I believe the number was about $800 million. And they took it to a federal judge, and, and in making that settlement, by the way, the NFL admitted no guilt. That was just, you know, here's money to go away. And the judge, I think it was in Minneapolis, looked at it and said, no, 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 no. This is, this is not a fair settlement for you. You need to go back. So they went back, and they raised the money. So it went it went over a billion dollars. I don't remember the exact figure, but it was over a billion. It was about ten million dollars a team. You know, it's basically nothing for these teams that are worth, the, as we see here, six billion dollars. So what was ten million dollars in a settlement? Yeah, it's just you know money to to make it disappear. Well, that would have been fine, except the players, as the Post has has found out, uh, have had a very very difficult time collecting the money. 
And they reviewed more than this post did more than 15,000 pages of documents relating to efforts by more than 100 former players to qualify for a settlement, including thousands of pages of confidential medical and legal records. They interviewed over 100 people involved in the settlement and 10 board certified neurologists for their expertise on how dementia is typically diagnosed. And among the things they found, the definition for dementia requires significantly more impairment than the standard definition used in America. So these players or their their families, they're coming forward and they're saying, well, he had dementia. Oh, really? Well, you know, show us this, show us that. And they've lawyered up to um, to protect this money. And I think I haven't read the whole thing, but my my first blush is that that the league doesn't want to open anything up. Like they don't want to open this up for further litigation, so they're trying to narrow it as much as possible. Uh, more from the story: at least 14 players have, like Irv Cross. Irv Cross has passed away. He's he was a great player for the Philadelphia Eagles and uh, became, I think, he was the first African American analyst in in the history of the NFL, and later was a part of the uh, the famous pregame show hosted by Brent Musburger, the NFL Today. But uh, they say at least 14 players like Irv Cross have failed to qualify for settlement payments and then died only to have CTE confirmed via autopsy. In more than 70 cases reviewed by the Post, players were diagnosed with dementia by board-certified doctors only to see their claims denied by the administrative law firm that oversees the settlement. While the NFL is often blamed or denied claims on fraud, none of the denials reviewed by the Post contained allegations of fraud. In total, court records show the settlement has approved about 900 dementia claims since it opened in 2017, but has denied nearly 1,100, including 300 involving players who were diagnosed by the settlement's own doctors. So even when there is money set aside by the owners for this, they're lawyering up up to protect spreading it out. And I guess, I can only guess, that a lot of it has to do with them exposing themselves in other cases, setting precedent by by giving the money. Boy, it is a it is a brutal money machine run by Roger Goodell. And also in this story, and it's a lengthy story, which I have to go through this afternoon, but Roger Goodell casts doubt on whether head trauma causes dementia and causes other neurological problems. I mean, you know, common sense would tell you that, but, you know, again, if if you're going to expose yourself in a legal situation, he's paid $60 million a year to try to prevent that from happening. And uh, I've seen League of Denial, which was done by PBS. Um, we saw the movie Concussion, uh, Bennett Amalu, uh, the cases of, of players who played a long time in the league and, and have suffered long-term effects. Um, now, you know, I've known several players who played a long time, some of them more than 12, 13, 14 years, and they're not affected by this. Ron Jaworski has said he thought he's he had 34 concussions when he played. I've seen him interviewed recently. He's in his 70s, looks sharp as a tack, sounds sharp as a tack, and was an analyst for ESPN into his late 60s. So it's, it's not the same for everybody, but some are affected by it, and, and it just seems – that there's overwhelming evidence when you look at the, the study by Boston University where you have players who donate brains and sometimes in incredibly tragic situations like Dave Duerson who played for the Bears and left a note saying he shot himself in the chest so he could have his brain examined by Boston University and they're finding CTE and they're finding it in, in players who don't even come close to the NFL. Like they've had even some, some high school cases. They've had guys who have gone to play like in the Ivy League and uh, they don't have a sniff of the NFL and they suffer from CTE. So, you know, it, it affects people differently, obviously. And you could always find a case for, for a player who played a long time and didn't have any problems because of it. And look, Troy Aikman had to uh, retire from the NFL because he'd had five documented concussions. Uh, he says that really wasn't the reason, but I'm sure that that played a factor in that. And he's gone on to this, you know, career in the NFL. There are players, though. Uh, Joe Namath was very concerned about this, and he got involved in a study where there's hope that the brain cells that are are destroyed in all of this can be revived. I don't know how how promising that is, but he's he's involved in that too. So, uh, 
it's 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 a it's a tough tough league, and most of the players, even though they know the risks of this, they will tell you, uh, and and many of them have you know aches and pains and and issues with their brains because of that. They say they do it all again. That's how much they loved it. So the the, the league has has that going for them as well. But yeah, this is this is not the first time that there's been an expose on the NFL shoving things under the under the uh, under the rug here and uh, and fighting players on money that they are, are were due were deserved and and the court said it and and one of the reasons too on that early settlement by the players in 2017 was you had players who needed money immediately and they didn't want to battle in court for a long, long time. It, they thought, well, if I can get, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars now rather than, you know, half a million down the road, I'm going to take that now because I need it. I need it for my care. And that's when, you know, the judge said, well, yeah, but you settled for too little. Go back and, and get some more. And they did. And, and the league, you know, $10 million a team. Yep. OK, fine. Let's move on. And here we are seven years later. And this is what the Post is reporting. All right, coming up in the next hour, uh, the Orioles sale. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, Got to be a, a very happy day for Orioles fans that they get rid of the Angelos family. And uh, Shannon Sharp in his conversation with Joe Buck about his incredible Hall of Fame career. We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. You know, we've really become tied up in legacy talk. I don't remember this when I was a kid. You know, what is Johnny Unitas' legacy? going to be you know what is Ernie Banks legacy going to be well he doesn't have any rings Ernie Banks never played in the postseason if he was playing today would people say well he got no rings well you know why are we considering him to be so great we, we weren't as tied up in legacy as we are now but boy when you talk about a player you've always got to put him in some kind of grouping is, is he one of the all-time greats is he really good is he hall of fame quality all those things that's that's all we seem to do here and we're going to get peter king's take on the two quarterbacks who play in the super bowl and, and about their legacy because i guess it's it's required asking when you talk to an expert like that dan patrick talked to him yesterday uh we'll get to that uh sterling sharp and shannon sharp our brothers and their story of how they grew up and became NFL stars is amazing. Shannon Sharp, who's now made it big in television. Sterling had a career, which I don't know. I don't know if it fell apart, but one time he was considered to be a star. Uh, but Shannon, uh, Shannon Sharp is, is having his day now. And uh, he talked several years ago to, uh, to, to Joe Buck about how it all happened for him, how he became a Hall of Fame player, mostly with the Denver Broncos. And we will get to that also 25 years ago today, the debut of The Family Guy. But there is news coming out of Baltimore. And uh, what a year plus it has been for this area. In November of 2022, we finally get word that Dan Snyder is partnering with Bank of America to America to explore the sale of the team. Hallelujah. And it became an even bigger cause for celebration when last April, April of 2023, it was announced that uh, Snyder and, uh, and, and the Harris Group had made a deal. And there was going to be a sale of the team, which just had to be approved by the owners, which was going to happen sometime during the summer. It did just before training camp. And we got new ownership here. If you're a Baltimore Orioles fan, you've probably felt much like Washington Commanders, Redskins, Washington football team fans had felt for 25 years under the ownership of Peter Angelos, who had owned the team for 30 years. Made the playoffs a couple of times, but uh, he was he was reviled by a lot of a lot of fans, most of the, the fan base there, and hasn't been seen for like 10 years. He's suffering from dementia. And what we had heard was, well, when, when he dies, it's in his will that the team will be sold. It won't be turned over to his sons. He is still alive, but last night, people in Baltimore got some really good news 
from Jerry Sandusky and others. This is Sandusky, the sports director of Channel 11 in Baltimore, also does the Ravens games on the radio with this. TV 11 sources confirm the Angelos family has reached an agreement to sell the Orioles to private equity firm billionaires David Rubenstein and Michael Arrighetti. The deal will include a transition of ownership over an unspecified time period. 11 News also has confirmed that O's Hall of Famer Cal Ripken Jr. will have a role in the new ownership group. Rubenstein and Arrighetti have been in talks to buy the Orioles for several months. The deal will give the new ownership group a beginning stake of at least 40% financial ownership with Rubenstein as what baseball calls the control person, the equivalent of a managing general partner. It is not clear the precise role Cal Ripken Jr. With his new, will have with this new ownership group. The structure of the deal will allow the Rubenstein Group to purchase the full 70% of the club owned by the Angelos family following the death of Orioles owner Peter Angelos. The 94-year-old team owner has spent the past several years dealing with illness and dementia. His son John Angelos is currently the team's chairman and CEO. This agreement must be approved by Major League Baseball owners. They are scheduled to meet next week in Orlando, Florida. Because of the complexity of the deal and the added complexity of the Orioles' legal battle with the Washington Nationals over revenue generated by Masson, the team's broadcast outlet, it is not yet clear if owners will vote on approving a sale next week or merely begin the due diligence process of reviewing the details of the agreement. According to multiple published reports, the Orioles franchise is currently valued at roughly $1.7 billion. Peter Angelos led a group that bought the Orioles in 1993 for $173 million. I'm not really good with math, but it appears that he got 10 times his money. That was pretty good over 30 years. I don't know. if yeah, Maybe Warren Buffett and others would say, well, that wasn't the greatest investment for him. If he would have taken the $173 million 30 years ago, he'd have more than $1.7 billion. Who knows? But it's a hell of a lot of money. And uh, it's it's apparently going to happen, and it's going to happen with David Rubenstein, which would seem to impact what might happen here with the Nationals. Now, there's several layers to this. One is that Rubenstein was reportedly going to partner with Ted Leonsis to buy the Nationals. And the main reason that Leonsis wants the Nationals is he wants the games for his monumental sports network. And in order for that to happen, the Masson deal, which is controlled by the Orioles, remember when the Expos moved here, part of the way to pacify Angelos was that he got control of the network. They were supposed to split the revenue equally, and they've been back and forth in court ever since about it, that the Nationals continue to win, but now there's even more years that are still tied up in litigation. And uh, that had to be resolved in order for the team to be sold. Otherwise, it wasn't going to benefit Leonsis as much as he wanted to. Now, you got Rubenstein, who grew up in Baltimore, so this, this team may be more near and dear to his heart. Uh, he's now got another partner, Arrighetti, who I'm not familiar with, but the two of them are going to be the main partners in uh, in owning the Baltimore Orioles. That means that Ted would have to partner with somebody else. And also, as you heard Jerry Sandusky say in that report, it's kind of fuzzy what happens with Masson. If the Masson deal goes away, then I think it, it could be full steam ahead with Leonsis and whoever else is interested or, or somebody else. Anybody might be interested. Now, the sale price, which was reported at two over $2 billion, by the Lerner family, that may still be realistic. Uh, even though the Orioles sold for less, it's a smaller market. Um, so the Washington market might be, uh, might be enough to put it over the $2 billion mark, and, uh, and maybe they could have a, a deal in place. The, the Mets sold for more than $2 billion, and that was, what, five, six years ago. And the way uh, sports teams have been in, inflated in value since then, uh, it might make sense. Uh, there's also some very good stability there uh, for the Rubenstein Group that uh, the lease at Camden Yards has been extended by 30 years. There's also a 15-year out in case they don't get all the improvements that they want. It's still a great ballpark. It's in a great location right off of 95. So this is, this is a, a great thing for Orioles fans and, and the Rubenstein group that they're, they're buying this. And now the question becomes, you know, how does this impact the Nationals and, and what happens? And there's, there's also been various reports that um, the Lerner family is split on whether or not they want to sell. Mark Lerner reportedly wants to keep the team and his sisters and uh, others, other family members who are involved in the team want to sell it. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and the question also is, 
while they have Mike Rizzo still, and Rizzo does, I think, a great job in, in putting together talent in the minor league system and building up through that way, uh, if they had new ownership, would they be spending more money? I think it's a little bit premature to be spending a lot of money on free agents now because they still have to build up the core a little bit more. But uh, but this could be this could have a trickle down effect for the Nationals, and it could be could be very big for them with this sale. And if you're an Oriole fan, you got to be deliriously happy that that the uh, Meshugana uh, Angelos family is is finally out of the picture. So uh, good things, good things apparently are happening in the area when it comes to uh, ownership. Go back to the NFL. Uh, Peter King, a guest yesterday on the Dan Patrick Show. A couple of things uh, caught my ear about what he said. Number one, this is a Super Bowl in Vegas. And we talked yesterday about what, what has happened to the ticket prices. The ticket prices for this Super Bowl versus the one that was played just four years ago between the same two teams have about doubled. It, it went from close to about $6,000 to go average price a ticket to go see it to now about $12,000. And the reason is it's Vegas. It's being played in Vegas. And that led Dan Patrick to ask this question of King. If I would have told you 30 years ago, Vegas would hold the Super Bowl, what would oh. you have said? Hey, if you had told me 20 years ago, eight years ago, <laughs> I would have said, you're out of your mind. It'll never happen. But the NFL got in bed with the gambling interest. Everybody's in bed with the gambling interest now. Everybody. It's not just the NFL. And it's not just every sports league. It's every media company now. Yeah. So uh, what do you what do you expect? Honestly, what do you expect? The NFL is going to play a Super Bowl in Las Vegas. It's totally insane to think about it. But again, that's the way our country is going right now. Yeah, I, I just worry because, you know, Commissioner Goodell was anti gambling in 2015. And of I don't he was. I don't know if anything changed other than they realized what their piece of the pie was going to be. And these other leagues realized their piece of the pie and what it was going to be. Dan, honestly, it's the one, the one reason why you can't blame the leagues, quite honestly. The one reason is very simple, is that the, the legal system in our country, the judicial system in our country, said gambling's fine go ahead all you states you make your own rules on gambling now you make your own laws it's up to you and so now we have uh legalized sports gambling in how many states in the country i don't know at least 20. and so you know that is what happened mm -hmm. but the nfl uh not only uh it, you know embraced gambling it's gotten full on into bed with gambling. And if if you can make money on it, the NFL sniffs it out and figures it out. No question about that. But this could be a slippery slope for the NFL. And there was a story last week from Mark Maskey in the Post about this, that players from the two teams that are in Vegas uh, not only can't bet on the game, obviously, but they can't even go into the casinos. They can't play a hand of blackjack. They can't pull a lever on a on a slot machine that can't happen uh the two teams that participate can't uh, you're gonna turn these players loose for a full week in vegas you know they get there monday sunday uh they, there's plenty of downtime. and what do you do in vegas besides go to the casinos that's what that's what you go to vegas for so they're not allowed in there that's that's going to be something to watch is somebody going to get nailed for that and also players and the Super Bowl is like a convention for the NFL, so you got all kinds of players from different teams. They are players who are in Vegas but not members of the participating teams are permitted to engage in legal gambling. They can go into the casinos, but they're prohibited from betting on the NFL and from entering a sports book until after the Super Bowl. So they can't even wander in there and bet on NBA games or NHL games or college games, whatever they want to do. So – Something is going to happen here. This is this is a, a prescription for disaster. And I'm not saying that, that Patrick Mahomes or Travis Kelsey are going to be foolish enough to do this, but there are going to be some guys from from each of these teams who are not going to pay attention to this and think, well, you know, I'm not I'm not a star. People aren't going to know me. I'll wear a hat and sunglasses and I don't go. Yeah, 
you know, watch out because the league has people watching. This this could be this could be a mess. This this could be one of the more more ticklish off the field situations for the NFL since the start of the Super Bowl. Uh, last thing from Peter King, and this is this is the legacy question that's almost required asking. Uh, Patrick asking Peter King, what does the Super Bowl mean for Patrick Mahomes, and what does it mean for Brock Purdy? Mahomes first. He's already had an absurd career. He's already had the kind of career that one third of the way through it that I'm pretty sure he'd make the Pro Football Hall of Fame if, uh, you know, two weeks from now, he never stepped on a football field again. But what what it would mean is it would accelerate his process in winning a third Super Bowl to basically competing with Tom Brady uh, to be the best ever. Because clearly, if you win a third Super Bowl in your first six years, that's an absurd start to your career. And again, look, Brady had sort of two careers. He had that first half you know, when he won three Super Bowls, then he had a drought and then he won three more. So I I don't know what it would do other than to just sort of put an exclamation point on what everybody already thinks of him, which is that he's got a very good chance of going down as the best of all time. What would a Super Bowl do for Brock Purdy? He's already an incredible story. And I think if he wins this game i mean maybe possibly could be you know we'll shut up all the people who think the 49ers are winning in spite of brock purdy which is so ridiculously insane you know and i hate the whole analytics element that that basically gives that breath because a guy who's the quarterback of a winning football team you can't make excuses for that. He has a lot to do with it. He doesn't have everything to do with it. And he has an incredible supporting cast. But let me ask you this question. How great is Jared Goff's supporting cast? It's probably the best supporting cast of any quarterback in football. And yet everybody talks about, oh man, Goff is really taking his game to the next level. (laughs) I mean, at some point you're going to have to, and again, look, Brock Purdy's had his hiccups this year. There's no question about it. But, you know, every quarterback does. And I just think the second half he played in that game and how he's played overall in his first, whatever, 25, 28 games in the NFL, it really should be enough for people now. But for some, it isn't. Yeah, I liked what uh, Alex Smith said over the weekend about Purdy. He said, as the unofficial gatekeeper of the game manager club, we're not letting him in. You know, he's he's better than that. And I guess without the the Tom Brady factor, which is a big factor, but without Brady as a sixth round pick winning seven Super Bowls, this would be miraculous. The last player picked in the entire draft, the last player winds up winning a Super Bowl in his second year. I mean, it's it's almost beyond belief. Um, Brady did it in his second year as a sixth-round pick under somewhat similar circumstances, uh, even maybe even greater circumstances in that Drew Bledsoe had been the number one pick of the draft and had taken the Patriots to a Super Bowl a few years earlier. Um, so, you know, what he did was was remarkable. But in, in this particular case, uh, I think he was the third-string quarterback. Was I think there was a – yeah, Trey Lance got a shot – um, no, I think that's that's the way it worked the year before. Trey Lance was the starter. He got hurt. Garoppolo, who surprisingly stayed with the 49ers, came in for him, did well, got hurt. Purdy takes over, did even better. And now in his second year and his first full year as a starter, could wind up uh, winning the Super Bowl. And in most cases, the Super Bowl champion, the uh, the quarterback is the MVP. So. It'll be a movie about it someday. All right, we got a uh, Super Bowl rematch from four years ago as the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers go at it again. And, uh, you know, this is how the turnover of the NFL works. It's only four years, but both teams have only eight players on the active roster who played for them in the first meeting. 53-man roster on each team, only eight left 
That would be Nick Bosa of the 49ers, along with Debo Samuel, George Kittle, Fred Warner, Dre Greenlaw, Eric Armstead, and Kyle Juszczyk, and Mitch Will- Wyshynski. Wyshynski? Not familiar with him. Uh, Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes will have Travis Kelsey, of course, Chris Jones, Harrison Butker, the kicker, McCole Hardman, James Winchester, Nick Allegretti, and Blake Bell. Uh, so each team with only eight players left over from the last time they played. So the Associated Press has a story today about Super Bowl rematches, you know, less than five years apart. And most recently, I guess, was, yes, it was most recently with the Patriots and the Giants. And both of those were incredibly close games. And you just think, you know, Brady could conceivably have, instead of seven rings, nine rings, especially the first one, 2007. These are the Patriots who looked, in, un, and they were unbeatable because they hadn't been beaten. They were 18-0 and 0 going into this, and if they won, they would, of course, surpass the 72 Dolphins. I remember being at that Super Bowl and doing Radio Row, and uh, a number of the Dolphins were walking around, particularly Mercury Morris, who was talking to anybody who would listen, and he said, hey, they're in our kitchen, but they're not in our living room yet. You know, Until you complete it, it's not over. And sure enough, um, you had that that incredible uh, helmet catch that was made, David Tyree, and uh, and the uh, Giants went on to win that game. And uh, then they met again in 2011, and uh, Eli Manning pulled off the game-winning drive, 57 seconds left for a 21-17 win. Uh, Cowboys and Bills, a lot different. They met in back-to-back Super Bowls, and both of them were, were lopsided, though – uh, in the second one, the first one was 52-17. to 17. I mean, the Bills were just destroyed in that game. Second game, they had a lead at the half. This was in Atlanta 30 years ago. And, uh, and then they decided, the Cowboys did, hey, we're just going to run the ball, Emmitt Smith, in the second half. And they did, and they won 30-13. to 13. Uh, The Cowboys and the Steelers, they met for the first time when I was in high school. This was Super Bowl X. And this was a, a great draft that the Cowboys had. They, they were figured to be a year away. But they had Roger Staubach, and that was the year that they had the Hail Mary play. That's the first play that's, you know, got the title Hail Mary to it. It was Staubach to Drew Pearson to win in Minneapolis. That sent them to the Super Bowl where they were playing a Steelers team that was defending champs. You know, they had had this incredible draft in 1974 when they took four Hall of Famers. And, uh, and the Steelers were able to win that game. They meet again in January of 1979, four years later. And it's a lot different, you know, then than it is now where you, each team is only bringing back eight players from their previous matchup. It seemed like everybody was back from the uh, 75 team for the 78 team that would meet the Broncos in the Super Bowl, uh, not the Broncos in the Super Bowl, but but uh, the the Cowboys. I'm saying they, they the, the Cowboys had beaten the Broncos the year before, so now the Cowboys are back, and now you got the Steelers back after a couple of years missing it, and uh, they proved to be the better team, though. That's the uh, that's the Super Bowl that had the Jackie Smith drop in it, and uh, and and that may have played a big factor because it was a close game. Um, it, it was only a, a, a four point win. For the Steelers, 35 to 31, uh, and uh, and Terry Bradshaw threw four touchdown passes in this game. Staubach tried to bring them back. Uh, he got a touchdown late, but uh, they came up short and they lost the game. And the Steelers, you know, four for four in Super Bowls over what a period of time. The first one was after the '74 season, and the last one was after the '79 season. So that's that's what you call a real dynasty, and. If the, if the Chiefs can manage to make it three in four years, you got to put them in that class. And then, you know, then you start talking about historic situations going into next year, if they can still win one more. I think it's, it's good. It's very difficult, more difficult now than it was then because you didn't have free agency. You know, all, the, all these Super Bowls that we're talking about here, except for the Giants and the Patriots, matches uh it was pre-free agency cowboys and bills that didn't come in until uh after the 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 second one or maybe the first it was the first year of free agency uh for the 93 season when they won that second one of course the steelers and the cowboys there was no free agency back in the day so we'll uh, we'll continue to yak about it the super bowl uh, takes over pretty much the uh later part of January and early February now, and we still got a week and a half to go and a lot more to talk about, and we'll do some more historical stuff 
as the week goes on. We've got a Tony show coming up next, and I will see you back here tomorrow beginning at, as usual, 9 a.m.